Everybody ready? Here we go. Okay. Oh, um, I'm ready. I think I'm ready. I have a cold. We'll see how far, I think it's affecting my brain, so we'll see how, how this goes. Uh, before we jump into the new series and the message for today, I wanted to update you on our um, generosity venture from our Advent season. We had partnered with uh, Central India Christian Mission uh, to send some uh, missionaries into an uh, unreached part of India, the Gujarat, state of Gujarat. Our goal was $10,800, which would allow us to send three um, church planters uh, and provide them with a bicycle or a motorbike to go into that region and begin to meet needs and share the gospel. Um, we didn't raise $10,800. We raised $22,150. So uh, that's just sort of mind-blowing that that kind of uh, generosity just, just came out of you guys. I'm just uh, in awe of it. I love it. And so what we're doing uh, is we're sending five um, missionaries into the state of Gujarat in 2023. And we took some of the extra funds and we purchased from Central India Christian Mission what they call blessings bags, which they give to uh, young people and children, which are, are filled with just things that they need, toiletries and food and clothes and a Bible. And we purchased 215 of those bags that will be handed out uh, by, the, by the missionaries. And so, yay God, good job, you guys. Uh, we're just really excited about what's going on there. And we'll uh, follow along with these church planters throughout the year. Uh, we'll get some updates and I'll share those with you uh, so that we can keep up with what God is doing uh, in that part of the world. And the reason why this matters to us, the reason why that we're, we're willing to, to put $22,000 uh, into something that's, that's halfway across the world with people that we'll, we'll never see or meet um, is because we, we believe in this idea that we, we have been sent by God, that we're here for a reason. And that when we discover and, and capture and embrace the purpose that God has laid on our lives, there's, there's just joy in that. There's joy in living a life with purpose. And in fact, for many people, the, some of the most difficult times that, that they go through are times when they, they, they feel purposeless, when, when life feels meaningless. But when we see the purpose that God has, has created us for and we embrace that, um, we get to find a lot of joy uh, living that way. Um, so... Part of this belief, part of what's, a, what's core to the Christian uh, faith is that we believe the gospel is for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. It's not just for people who live here and who are like us and speak our language and look like us. It's, it's actually for everyone. And, and we live in a culture where um, we, we value the fact that not everything is for everyone. That's why we have options. That's why we have choices because McDonald's is not for everyone, right? I mean, can we agree on that? I mean, Chick-fil-A is, McDonald's isn't, it's just not not for everyone. Um, sushi is not for everyone. Man buns are not for everyone. <laughs> like, some people do it well. I see you, brother. Um, it's in my own home. I just, it's just, but it's not for everyone. So, uh, but there, there are some things that are for everyone. And I think our culture more and more pushes back against that idea, that there are some things that actually are for everyone. But, but there are some basic human needs and basic human rights that are for everyone. Everyone needs and has a right to clean air and clean water and warm shelter and clothing and a place to live. Every human being on the planet has a need and a right to acceptance and belonging and freedom. And whenever we, as Jesus followers, we see humans who are being denied some of these basic needs and rights, we grow concerned and we wanna step in and we wanna participate in something that helps these people get what they need and have a right to, don't we? So if we believe that the gospel of Jesus is for everyone and we see people who don't have the gospel, some, something in us should grow concerned and we should have this desire to participate in something that makes sure that people see and hear the gospel. That's why we invested $22,000 in a mission in India. So uh, as we talk about this, and we're gonna talk about this for six or seven weeks here, and this is sort of gonna be our theme for the year. So we'll bring this back up over and over again. There are some foundational things we need to make sure we're on the same page about uh, so that we can build on these and move forward. And one of those is, the gospel, what do I mean by the gospel? The word gospel just means good news, right? So what is the good news? 
How, how would you explain it? If I, if I said, to you tell me, what is the good news about Jesus? What's so great about this Christianity thing? What is the good news? How would you respond to that? Well, one of the most helpful ways to respond is with a story. Do you like stories? I like stories. I like to read stories. I like to watch movies. I like to tell stories. I like to hear other people's stories. And I'm not alone. It's built into human nature. We all love stories. Every culture tells stories. And the gospel is a story. So I want to tell you the story of the gospel in a way that I think maybe you can uh, also tell. You can copy my way or you can put your own words to it, but uh, there are four basic movements to this story that I want to talk through with you really quickly and just establish that this is something we can all be on the same page about as Jesus followers. Because as Jesus followers, we're not on the same page about everything. Are you aware of that? Like there are some things that we actually disagree about and that's okay. We still love each other and we're family. But this is something that we need to all be on the same page about. So here's the gospel story. It begins with creation, that there is a good God who created the universe and the earth and everything on it, and he created human beings, and he put something special in humans. He calls it his image. He put his image in human beings, and he invites human beings into this relationship, this partnership, where he and humans are going to work together. God made all of the raw materials of creation, and he invites humans to care for it and to bring good things out of it. So take, take all the plants and make salad or make coffee and make tacos, like bring good stuff out of the world. You know, take all the raw materials and make indoor plumbing and hot tubs. Like I want you guys to be a part of this and bring good things out of the creation that I made. And he gave the humans one rule, one boundary. He said, if we're going to make, if we're going to work together to make good things out of the world, then someone has to define what's good, right? And God said, that's got to be me. That's got to be me. I'm the one who made everything. I'm the one who knows how everything works. You have to let me be the one who defines what's good. And so to represent this choice, he put a tree in the garden, called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And so this is the choice facing humans. Are we going to let God be the one who defines good for us, or are we going to take that right on ourselves? Enter the enemy of God, the serpent, the tricky one, the deceiver, the liar, the accuser, who whispers into the ears of the humans, God is holding out on you. Like God is is keeping good things back from you. Maybe it would be better if you were the ones in charge, if you were the ones who decided what's good and bad for yourselves. Maybe that's what true freedom is, is for you to decide what's right and wrong for you. Does that sound familiar? It's a lie. It's a lie, and Adam and Eve bought it, and when they bought it, they ate the fruit from the tree in an act of rebellion against God. Sin enters the world, and evil and pain and suffering and death and all the things that come with it. Because it turns out that human beings are not very good at determining what's good and bad, are we? We call this the fall. This is the fall of humanity. When we rebel against God, we choose to determine right and wrong for ourselves, and we just blow it. Over and over and over again, human beings blow it. We can look around, we can see this problem in the world. The world has fallen. Why is there so much evil? Why is there so much pain and suffering? Because humans rebelled against God and chose to decide right and wrong for ourselves. God could have just thrown up his hands and said, well, that experiment didn't work out. Good luck to them. But instead, he held on to this vision, this ideal of this this kingdom, this reality where God partners with his people made in his image to bring good out of creation, and he begins a plan of redemption. His plan of redemption focuses throughout the Old Testament on the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, where he, his goal is to show the world what it looks like to live in relationship with him through this nation. And sometimes they get it right, and things are great, and sometimes they get it horribly wrong, and things are terrible. And we go, yeah, that sounds like humanity, doesn't it? Part of this plan of redemption is God is going to enter into humanity himself, and he does that in the person of Jesus. Jesus comes into the world as God and human in the flesh, and he begins to show people what renewal looks like. He begins to heal those who are sick. He begins to forgive those who have sinned, and he introduces this concept of renewal. And then Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, and he begins to invite people into this kingdom this place, this reality where God's rule and reign are still absolute, where people allow God to be the one who decides right from wrong, and we let go of that for ourselves. That's the kingdom. And in this kingdom, renewal is happening. And then Jesus goes to a cross 
where his body is broken and his blood is poured out to pay for the sin of rebellion against God, to set people free from the power of that sin. So now we don't have to repeat the cycles of Israel where we sin and rebel and then we we get punished and we need forgiveness. We can actually live in this relationship with God where forgiveness is just part of the deal. Jesus' death brings that about. And then he rises from the dead and he proves that renewal doesn't, is not just limited to healing from sickness or forgiveness from sin. Renewal is a whole life thing. You can have a brand new life in the kingdom of God. And he sends his disciples out with this message about a kingdom where renewal is possible. And then he promises his disciples that he's gonna come back someday and make everything new. That's the gospel. And you and I are still a part of this story. In fact, the whole Bible is this story. And so whenever we read the Bible, we should locate whatever we're reading in this story of the gospel. Where does it fit in the story of creation, fall, redemption, and renewal? That helps us when we read scripture to understand how to uh, put these things in context of God's story. Because when we take things, uh, we read something in the Bible that we, we kind of don't understand or we think it means this. And we, we, it's like taking like the, the middle 30 seconds out of a movie. I don't know what's a, what's a good movie. You've Got Mail. It's a great movie. If you just take 30 seconds out of the middle where these two people are just emailing each other back and forth, you kind of go, this is stupid. What is this about? I don't even... But when you put it in context of the whole story, it's, a, it's kind of a, I mean, it's a cheesy, but it's, it's kind of an endearing little love story and it leaves you feeling happy at the end. But sometimes we take Bible, you know, we read a passage and we just take it on its own, not in context of the big story and, and we either distort the meaning or we don't understand the meaning. So it helps us to read the Bible to know this story and it helps us to live out the gospel to know this story of creation, fall, redemption, and renewal and to locate ourselves in it. Where are we? We're still in the renewal part. We're we're in the part where Jesus has invited people into his kingdom where new life is possible and we get to be a part of making things new while we're waiting for Jesus to come back and make all things new. That's the gospel. When we can show and tell the gospel, when we can demonstrate it with our lives and speak it with our mouths, we get to be a part of inviting people to life with Jesus. And this is what we have been sent to do. It's what we have been sent to do. This is actually the mission statement of Cicero Christian Church, inviting everyone to life with Jesus because that's where it's at. This reality of the kingdom of God where healing and forgiveness are just a way of life. That's where it's at. So we're inviting people into that. We're in in this uh, process of renewal and we're waiting for Jesus to come back and make all things new. So how do we know that this is the job of every person? I want us to take a look at John chapter one really briefly this morning. Um, If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to open or that'll be on the screen. You can follow along. John chapter one, in uh, in John's gospel, he begins by telling about John the Baptist. This is part of how you know the Bible must be true because if you're making up a story, uh, you would give people different names so it doesn't get so confusing, right? So you've got John, the disciple who's writing the gospel of John, talking about John the Baptist, right? And John the Baptist is kind of going ahead of Jesus and he's telling people, uh, all of Israel, hey, you've, you've been deciding for yourself how your religion should be practiced instead of letting God be the one who decides. And he calls them to repent, to let go of their right to decide how to, how to do their religion and actually just be in relationship with God in his way. And then he tells people that there's somebody coming who's gonna change everything. Right? There's somebody coming who's going to change everything. And then uh, we're going to pick up here in John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if you're a, a Jewish person living in the first century, that statement is going to bring a lot of different things to mind. and It's not going to make a whole lot of sense right off the bat because he's using, he's kind of mashing some things together that never got mashed together before. And he's pointing at a human being and and saying, this is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But whatever they understood about what John was trying to say, one thing was clear. John believed that that person had been sent by God. Jesus was the sent one from the father to human beings. And he said, that's the guy I've been talking about. That's the guy that's gonna change everything. And we'll skip down to verse 35. There'll be some underlined portions on the screen. I invite you to read out loud with me. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. 
When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon's Peter, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Yeah. So Andrew was following John the Baptist, listening to his teaching, kind of on board with what he's saying. He sees John for the second time point to this man and say, that's the Lamb of God right there. That's the guy. That's the one I'm talking about. So he just, he's like, well, then what am I doing with you, knucklehead? I'm, I'm, I should be with him. So he, he begins to follow Jesus. And he spends an afternoon with Jesus. And the next thing he does is goes and gets his brother. And he says, Peter, you got you to gotta meet this guy. Why does he do that? Did, did Jesus tell him to go and get his brother? Did he send him to go and get his brother? Did he say, actually, uh, you've got a brother. I like you, but your brother's gonna be more famous than you. Can you go get him? Because we really need him. Or did Andrew just do it? I don't think there's any indication that Jesus sent Andrew to go get Peter. But he did. Why did he go? Because when you meet someone who changes your life forever, you grab the people that you love and you say, you have got to meet this guy. You've got to meet this guy. So he grabs Peter and brings him to Jesus. Let's continue. Verse 43, the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathaniel declared, All right, so this is the next, this is the same like time period, the same people. Philip might have been one of the two when, you know, J uh, John says there were two who were following John the Baptist who then went and followed Jesus. Andrew was one. Philip might have been the other one. And Jesus is getting ready to leave the area. So he says, Philip, I want you to come with me. I want you to follow me. And Philip's like, hang on a second. Kind of bold of him to say that to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But he's like, hang on a second. And he goes and gets Nathaniel. And he tells Nathaniel, I found him. I found the guy. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is the guy I've been talking about. We found him. You've got to come and meet him. And Nathaniel's not very impressed with Jesus's like resume, where he's from and all these things. But Philip just makes it super simple. You just need to come and see. You need to meet him. If you just meet him, it all makes sense. Did Jesus send Philip to Nathanael? I mean, we don't have any indication that he did. He just went. Why did he go? Because when you meet the person who changes your life forever, you grab the people that you love and you say, you have got to meet this guy. You've got to. This guy is gonna change everything. You gotta meet him. Philip and Andrew, I think, just set a great example for us. No one, no one told them they were sent. They didn't sign some kind of commitment form. They, they, they didn't raise their hand in a crowd. They met Jesus, and the most natural thing in the world for them to do was to grab the people they cared about and invite them to life with Jesus. They were sent before they ever knew they were sent. They just went. I love that. Because I think we, we come up with all kinds of obstacles and reasons why I can't, I, I'm not gonna be the one to share the gospel with these people because the idea of sharing the gospel sounds really complicated and super spiritual and there are other people who know more and can do that. These guys knew Jesus for less than one day. They had never heard the Sermon on the Mount. They had never seen a miracle. They didn't know he was gonna die on the cross for their sins and rise from the dead. And still they went. 
I mean, you could fill some books with the stuff that you and I don't know, right? About God, about the Bible, about how all this works. You could fill pages and pages with stuff you and I don't know. But what do we need to know in order to invite somebody to life with Jesus? We just need to know Jesus. They spent one day with him and they were convinced, my friends need to meet this guy. One day. It's not that complicated. It's not. It takes a little courage. It, it takes a little thought. It takes a whole lot of compassion for the people that you love, but it's not super complicated. Here's what they did that I think is a good model for us when it comes to the gospel. They heard it, okay? They heard John the Baptist talk about it and they spent time with Jesus. I'm sure Jesus taught them some things. They believed what they heard and then they participated in it. Now, for a lot of us, or maybe the way you're raised, or maybe what's happening in, in Christian culture around us, that it's really easy to stop after hear and believe. You just, you just hear somebody talk about it. You believe it. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And I think my best shot at heaven, not hell, is with him. I believe it. And we stop there. But these guys didn't stop, and there's no indication in any other part of Scripture that you stop after believe. There's this implication that you also are gonna participate. No one had to tell Andrew and Philip to participate. They just knew, this is what we're doing. I met Jesus, I gotta tell people. I met Jesus, I gotta tell people. This is what we're doing. Hear, believe, and participate. When we buy into that, we, we can embrace this reality that you and I have been sent. And Jesus does explicitly state it for them later. In John chapter 20, Jesus is gonna tell them in no uncertain terms. So this happens after the crucifixion. He's already died on the cross and then he rose from the dead. Now at this point, okay, you saw him die and now he's standing in front of you alive and well. Are you, are you interested in what this man might have to say? Do you think that he might say things that are important that you should write down and remember and probably do? Man, if they were ever listening to Jesus, at this moment, they are listening. They are all ears. They're on the edge of their seat. You say it, we'll do it because you just died and rose from the dead, right? And here's what he says. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. He makes it clear. In case you guys didn't get it already, you are sent. You are sent. As the Father sent Jesus, how did he send Jesus? Not into positions of power, or influence, but in partnership with the Father. That's how Jesus is sending us. We, we don't need positions of power and influence. If we have them, we should absolutely leverage them for the kingdom and for the good of others, but we don't need those. We just need partnership with the Father through the Holy Spirit. We have been sent. So this is the, this is the challenge. I, I want you to stretch your imagination with me throughout this series. And I want you to imagine that you live where you live because you have been sent there. That you work where you work because you have been sent there. That you go to school where you go to school because you have been sent there by God to show someone the gospel. To show someone what it means to be invited into the kingdom of God where he's making things new. He's bringing healing and forgiveness as just a way of life. You have been sent there where you are for a purpose. And there is so much joy in living out that purpose. I'll, let's be honest and acknowledge that not everybody's feeling joy today. Can we acknowledge that? And life is just up and down and it's difficult. There are challenges. There are some dark times that go along with the bright and sunny times. And today may not be a day of joy for you. So here's what I'm not saying. That, that when you embrace this missional purpose, your, your life gets better and all the dark times go away and all the difficult things are in the past. Jesus told his disciples in no uncertain terms, hey, you're gonna have a hard time of it. Life is hard. You remember that human rebellion thing and all the evil and sin and suffering that came in as a part of that? You're still gonna have to deal with that. Until the day he comes back to make all things new, we have to live in this world the way that it is. The joy comes from knowing that we serve a God who doesn't wanna leave it this way. Aren't you glad for that? Whatever dark stuff you're facing, aren't you glad that we serve a God who doesn't want to leave it this way? 
but actually has invited us in that as we struggle, as we suffer, that we get to do it in a way that shows people we serve a God who cares. We may not have all the answers to why, but he cares. He's with us in it. And when people get to see that, I mean, we can't avoid suffering in this world, but why not do it with someone who cares about us and has the power to comfort and heal and forgive? There's joy in living with this purpose, even when everything in your life isn't joyful, right? This is what I want for you and for me is to have the joy of living with a purpose. Even, even when everything in life is not the way I wish it was, I can find joy in knowing that I can, in just very simple terms, do the things that God has created me to do. And you can too. And when we do it, there's, a, there's just a good chance that somebody is gonna get to experience life with Jesus because of us. It's worth the effort, it's worth the cost. So we're, we're gonna invite you throughout this series to, to pray and think about this idea that you have been sent to one. I know the idea of being sent feels like, holy cow, there's a lot of people out there that don't know Jesus. I don't know what difference I can make, but here we go. No, no, let's just think about it in terms of one. And maybe there's more than one for you. Maybe there's 10 or 12, but I mean, let's just start simple. Let's do something we can do. Let's embrace the reality that you have been sent to one. Now, who, is, who is your one? Well, for our purposes, your one is someone that you know personally who is not currently following Jesus, right? Your one is not a faithful attender at another church, okay? We're, we're on the same page with all the other churches in our area and we're, we're on the same team and we're not looking to get people to stop going to one church and go to a different one, right? We're, we're sent to people who, who we know personally who are not currently following Jesus, someone who is local to us. Your you're, you're one doesn't live in California or um, can, can, Canada, Canada? What was I saying there? Canada? Canada's weird anyway, I don't know. Uh, your person lives locally and it's someone that you're willing to arrange your schedule to spend time with. So this is somebody that you're not just gonna leave it to chance to accidentally bump into them or casual conversation, but you're gonna arrange your schedule to spend time with them. That's your one. You're sent to that one. It's possible that you live where you live, you work where you work, you bike where you bike, you work out where you work out, you eat where you eat because you have been sent there. So I just wanna invite you to begin praying about this with me because our, our goal, we don't, we're not special. Like, like we're not like better than other people. We know this, right? We're just, we've just been invited to life with Jesus. That's all we've got but it's something worth sharing, isn't it? Something we can embrace like Andrew and Philip who just say like, I don't, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this. I, I don't know if I know enough. I, I don't have enough scripture memorized. I, I've only known Jesus for one day, but man, I really want other people to meet him. That's all we need. And that's enough. So I wanna invite you to, to pray through this with me. Would you stand with me? I just want you to pray about two things. So one is, how well do you know the gospel story? And I wanna put it in terms of story because if I say, can you share the gospel with someone? You might think of like, oh, I need, I need the four spiritual laws or I need five different points. Or I, I, I want us to think of it in terms of a story because we can all share stories, right? Do you, do, how many of you uh, get together with people that you've known for more than 15 years? but you, you can still get together with people you've known for at least 15 years or more. What kind of stories do you tell when you get together with those people? The same ones, right? I mean, it's just the same stories of, of you being stupid or crazy or dumb or your parents or whatever. You tell the same stories over and over again, don't you? Because that's the fabric of your relationship is those stories. And for Christians, the fabric of our relationship with each other is the gospel story. It's who we are. So we should be able to tell it like pretty easily. So I wanna invite you, if that's not something you feel like you can do, that you would uh, pursue that. And then I wanna invite you to pray, um, to ask God, am, am I really sent? Am I really sent to one? God, is this real? Is this true? I mean, this bald Yahoo on the stage is telling me this. Is it true? I don't know if it's true or not. He's, he's not always right. Is this true? Pray about it. Ask God, is this true? Am I sent? And if so, how can I embrace it and live it out?
All right, you want to pray that with me? Let's do that. God, thank you so much for the truth of the gospel. Thank you for putting it in a story so it, it, it actually makes sense to us and we can understand it and we can share it. And I thank you, God, that, uh, that you have sent us. I believe it 100%. That there are people in my life who don't know Jesus. That's what I want for them. So would you help me through your spirit and through the friendships that I have here in this church family to live my life with purpose? And would you do that in me and in our whole church family here? In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you, go in peace, be salt and light. The world needs Jesus.